Jesus suffering on the cross is a picture difficult to understand. He was betrayed by a friend, arrested and falsely sentenced to death. He was beaten and whipped, a crown made of thorns pressed into his head. Bearing the cross, he stumbled and staggered up the hill to Golgotha. Each step of the journey getting worse, spit on, cursed, and mocked. But Jesus never looked back. He kept going. Jesus could have avoided the cross, called down fire from heaven, or summoned legions of angels to rescue him, to save him. But Jesus was not interested in saving himself. He was all about saving you. Every detail of this torturous path to the cross was part of God's plan to bring you to Him. We're all broken. We've all messed up and have all made wrong choices. And no one had to teach us as a baby about anger and selfishness. We just came out that way, sort of a sin covering. But on the cross, with His blood He shed, the Bible says, Jesus blotted out our record of sin, nailing it to his cross. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin covering. And his blood is our ticket, our ticket to enter through a new door, a forever relationship door with God. So what do we do with this great news? The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, it's not enough to believe in Jesus with just your head. You must believe with your heart. Now, there's just one person alone at the foot of the cross. It is you. What will you say to Jesus? Say, thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. I'm giving you my heart today, Jesus. I do believe you died for me and that you were raised from the dead for me. Please give me a new heart and a new life right now. God hears you and he is answering your prayer. The love of God is being poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And with that, brothers and sisters, I want to introduce Brother Wu. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, Brother Wu and I were on the phone just last night until almost 2.30 in the morning talking about this, talking about other things. And the wonderful Holy Spirit-led stuff that the Holy Spirit gave to Brother Wu, if you think this was mind-blowing, wait until you see what Brother Wu has to show you. And even after Brother Wu is done talking and giving his portion of the teaching, Brother Wu and I are going to open up the mic. And we're going to have an open mic session between the two of us and wait until you see what the Holy Spirit gave us last night. We couldn't stop talking. Once Brother Wu and I, we started talking around 11 o'clock last night. And once we started talking, we felt the Holy Spirit talking to us. And he gave us even more and more and more. What I just showed you is nothing compared to the more that the Holy Spirit gave us last night. This teaching is going to be endless today. Get ready, brothers and sisters. When Brother Wu shows you what he's going to show you, what he got, this is just amazing. And then we're going to even add more to that after he's done teaching with our open mic session. Brothers and sisters, this night is just going to get even more explosive. And with that, Brother Wu, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, thank you for patiently waiting here in the background. Um, so come on, brother, and enlighten everybody with your finds. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Um... Yeah, as uh, Brother Charles was saying, um, we were on the phone yesterday till like almost 2.33 in the morning uh, talking. Um, you know, Brother Charles has been saying that for the last two months, he's been, you know, on his knees praying to the Lord, um, humbling himself, um, you know, asking God uh, what we should do. Um, in that two months for me, you know, to be completely honest, I was very sick. I I had like a, a skin allergy um, all across my whole body that lasted like a week. And the doctors, it happened twice, uh, well, one month after the other. And then I ended up getting a cold and you can probably tell I'm a little congested right now still. Um, but then most of my cough is gone now. 
Um, but I was just going through like physical and spiritual warfare uh, during that time. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, me and my and brother Charles, we said that let's talk about 15, 20 minutes tomorrow because we have to prepare for the video. And we ended up talking for three, four hours. And I didn't really know exactly what to talk about today. But after Charles showed me the things from the first half of this video, um, and uh, we were just talking in fellowship. Um, for me, it was such a time of, of blessing because uh, being so sick and just in bed and uh, you know not being able to function properly, I, I don't feel like I've gotten proper fellowship, um, you know. And uh, I was really, you know, arguing with God about some of these uh, things that I was going through. Um, <clears throat> but to have a, a righteous brother praying for you uh, there by your side and and diligently seeking the Lord on your behalf in your time of weakness. It really strengthens you and encourages you. And uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about today actually has to do with the conversation that came about from yesterday. So this is, um, you know, preparation that I had to do during, during the middle of work. Uh, and so I'm going to try my best to, um, in, in a humble way, to get this across to you about the Passover. Um, but um, I hope that you'll bear with us. And I, I thank you guys for being patient over the last uh, month or two. Um, I know that uh, we haven't been um, as communicative, but we definitely have been thinking about the Lord. Uh, we didn't want to be sensationalist and put something out that um, you know we weren't sure about. And so we really did take that time to um, take a break and to have like a Sabbath. Sabbath. Um, <clears throat> uh, jumping into what we're talking about today, uh, it's going to be a continuation of the Passover part that Charles just talked about. I'm so excited to be sharing this with you guys. Uh, I had so much fun just talking to Charles about this in the spirit yesterday. And, uh, uh, you know, as you know, um, the spirit leads me to really tie things in from the Old Testament to the words of Jesus Christ in the Gospels to the book of Revelation, um, you know, from Moses and Genesis um, all the way throughout scripture to the end. And then how that ties in historically, uh, the cultural context of Jewish tradition, and also um, defining words and terms based on scripture alone, not our own interpretation of what we think it might be. Um, so we're going to talk about how the things that Charles talked about in the first portion uh, just built upon and, and, and made this amazing foundation uh, for what we're going to go into. But we're going to talk about how all the things that Charles talked about in the first portion are actually completely fulfilled in the future. Uh, and there's scripture that proves it. And there's things all over that's going to tie Passover as being this important day um, through, throughout time uh, since the beginning. And so we're going to talk about Passover fulfillment multiple ways. So before we go into Passover, um, I'm going to talk about the Galilean wedding, the wedding, the ancient Israel wedding. Um, we've talked about this in the past, but it builds a foundation because uh, I'm going to tie in how Passover and the Galilean wedding, wedding is tied together. And I'm gonna talk about how all this is tied into uh, the words of Jesus, uh, all tied into Revelation, all tied into even Abraham and uh, the books of Moses. So the steps of a Galilean wedding or an ancient Israel wedding is you have a Kaduba, which is the marriage covenant or the contract that's made originally between the parents. Then you have the Mohar, which is the purchase, purchase price or the gift for the bride um, that, that pays the price. Um, you have the mikvah or the ritual, ritual cleansing that happens after that, uh, before uh, the, the wedding is uh, consummated. Um, after that, there's a preparing of the house. The groom goes to prepare a separate portion of the house from the father's house. And that is the, um, the marriage bed, the, the wedding chamber, um, where the husband and the wife will live together. And the, the son goes to prepare this place and the marriage supper that happens after the ketubah, after the covenant, original covenant, uh, only can happen if the father approves of that preparation of that separate house being completed. And then the, the father will say, now you can go and get your bride. After that, uh, when the father tells him to go get your bride, the bridegroom goes out and he calls the bride. It's called the midnight cry, and we'll go into that in a little bit. Uh, then there's the wedding ceremony that happens after you get your bride. Um, and so it's a two-part process in the Jewish wedding. You have the the covenant, the ketubah, the contract in the beginning, and you have your, your time together as, as husband and wife there. And then you have the second part, which is the, the wedding ceremony, the, the supper that happens a year later. And you stay apart for a year without seeing each other. Um, and then after that last uh, nisuin, 
the wedding ceremony or the supper, you have this wedding celebration that continues on for seven days and seven nights, uh, sometimes more, and it depends on that family and how big that celebration is. <clears throat> so uh, in the first part, Charles talked about how um, there are the um, 14 years that the Jacob's trouble, there's the seven years that go by quickly, um, which we think is the 2014 uh, up until 2021, 2022 that we are in now, the uh, Jacob's easy years. Uh, and then you have the next 14 years, are, which are the troublesome years of tribulation. And if you disagree with us on that, it's okay. It's, it's not a matter of, of uh, you know, of salvation. Um, it's, it's something that, that we won't be here to fully experience. Uh, hopefully we'll all be gone by then because we're watching for the Lord to come and we are the bride. Um, but basically women, they were betrothed at the age of 13. Um, that was when they can make their own decision for themselves to say yes or no to something. Uh, they were considered adults. And uh, after that betrothal period happened, the ketubah, uh, at, at year 13, um, a year later on year 14 is when they would have the wedding supper or the wedding ceremony. Um, you know, a lot of scholars, they believe that Mary and Joseph, uh, which are the, the, the parents of, of Jesus, um, that Mary, she was betrothed at 13 and then was having their, the marriage ceremony at 14. Uh, but in that period, between the 13th and the 14th year, uh, Mary became pregnant uh, through the Holy Spirit. And so that's why with Mary and Joseph, they were technically considered married from their betrothal, but they were not actually together. They hadn't had their, their, their wedding ceremony. And that's when Mary had gotten pregnant. And that was between probably the 13th and 14th year. So that's why, uh, you know, some people say, oh, you know, were they married or were they not married? Well, they were married uh, because they were betrothed and they had the ketubah. Um, just like when you propose uh, here, um, you know, in, in this culture, you're engaged to someone. Well, that engagement is actually considered being married to that person. So you're considered the bride and the wife at the same time, the husband and the groom at the same time, starting from that betrothal that happens in that 13th year usually. <clears throat> so the ketubah is a written proposal. It's, it's sometimes read in front of the town gates, say in Jewish culture, so that all the elders and all the people will know what's going on. It's a public declaration. And it's the groom's father. It's, it's a witness in, in front of the bride's father and all the people there that they agree upon this um, union that's, that's happening. The mohar, which is the bride price, is paid for by the groom's father to the bride's father, and it's like an insurance. There's also a thing called the cup of wine, which is also known as the cup of joy. So at the betrothal ceremony, right, the bride can accept or reject uh, this cup of wine. So basically there's a sharing of wine that happens and a sharing of bread that happens at the betrothal. And that sounds very familiar because that's exactly what happens at the Lord's Supper um, at the Eucharist. So you have this sharing between the disciples and Jesus Christ of the wine and the bread. This brother, cup of joy. Were, were you sharing your screen, brother? Oh, am I not sharing my screen? Uh, we, it, it, it kind of did at first, and then, and I think it just, it's, it's been cut out for the last couple of minutes. We were, we're not sure. Okay. Uh, hold on. My uh, computer is acting weird. Can't get up. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, it, it's okay. on. There. Sorry about that. No, no, no problem. And, and when you first came on, it looked like you were about to share your screen, so I wasn't sure if you were going to read something or if you. Oh were yeah, I think I, I just forgot to share the screen. That's okay. Yeah, That's we're we're good. Mistake. Everything's good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charles. You're welcome. So at at the betrothal, uh, they drank from the same cup and they ate from the same bread. Um, and 
the, the groom, when he drinks uh, from the same cup to accept, um, just like after the bride accepts, he says the words, you are now consecrated to me by the laws of Moses, and I will drink it again anew with you in my father's house. These are actually words that were repeated in Jewish tradition for those who were betrothed to each other at the betrothal ceremony. You are now consecrated to me by the laws of Moses, and I will drink it again anew with you in my father's house. And this is uh, similar to what's repeated in the words of Jesus when he says that he, what did, what did Charles just say right now? Brother Charles, up until now, he read verses that specifically said that Jesus Christ said he will not drink it again until he is in the kingdom of heaven. So we're talking right now about how this Passover is tied to this Galilean wedding, how these um, disciples, they knew that all of these, word, these words that Jesus was using at the Last Supper, it happened to do with a Jewish proposal, a Jewish betrothal, um, a ketubah that's going on. And like I said before, you're considered married at this point. So even the disciples at the Last Supper, from that point on, that's their betrothal. That's the proposal. They were engaged from that point on. And there's a future point where he says that he will prepare a place for you in the father's house. That's exactly what happens during a marriage. So these are all Galilean wedding inferences that are talked about uh, in the gospels over and over again uh, during this Last Supper. <clears throat> so at the betrothal, you drink from the same cup because you're family now and family drinks from the same cup. They trust each other. There's not gonna be poison there. Um, you don't care about the germs that are switched between you. You guys are one, just like the food you eat is one, just like the wine you drink is one, the bread you share is one. And this communion, this union, right? This communion between the bride and the groom is the sharing of the breaking of the bread and the sharing of this wine, you know, um, where you both put your lips and your mouth and drink from the same place, keep in the same place. Um, after the betrothal, you lived apart for a year usually, uh, and then you prepared for the wedding feast during that time. The, 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 the bride was to you know, remain chaste and to keep herself pure, to prepare her dress and um, her garments, uh, all the preparations before the wedding. The groom is to go prepare the, the place near the father's house for the bride uh, to you know, get the clothes garments ready for all the guests because the father prepares all the clothes for the guests that are coming to the wedding, um, all the food, you have to order, you know, cake or whatever it is. So, you know, when these things happen, this is one of the biggest events in a, a town uh, in, in the ancient um, Jewish culture. So this was the thing that everyone wanted to go to, that, that everything, everyone wanted to be invited to. If you didn't go to this, then, you know, you're missing out on the biggest party of the year. And so, when, when these things are happening, you begin hearing rumors like that, um, you know, the cake is ready or the, the house, the father's chamber, the son's chamber, bridal chamber is uh, upon completion and that, you know, the bride is finished getting the materials for her dress. Like in this town, you begin hearing rumors of what's going on. So it's true that only the father of the groom, um, he's the one who, when he says, and he knows for sure that the bridal chamber is prepared by his son. Uh, in the middle of the night, he'll wake up his, his son and say, go and get your bride, you know? And this usually will be done around midnight. Uh, and he'll, he'll go out, he'll, the, the, the groom will be sleeping with his groomsmen when it gets close to the time of the wedding because he knows that he's gonna have to go with the bridal party to go and get his bride. Um, so even the bride, she's gonna be sleeping in her wedding dress and her bridesmaids, um, they're going to be sleeping with uh, like you see in Matthew, the, the virgins, the 10 virgins, uh, they sleep with their candles, with their the, the oil ready um, and the candles ready to be lit for when the bridal party comes to get them during what's called the midnight cry. And so the father tells the son, go and get your bride. He wakes up and he tells his groomsmen that are next to him, let's go and get the bride. He, you know, does a large, large shout and, uh, you know, trumpets and shofars are blown and they, and then the bridal party goes and gets his bride. And then more and more townspeople, they join that bridal party. And then eventually after they pick up the bride, um, they go into the father's house and they have this celebration where they close the doors off for a number of days. So if, if this sounds very, very familiar to you, it should sound familiar because it's pretty much what's going on during the Passover, during this betrothal of what Jesus is telling the disciples about the betrothal that is happening between Jesus Christ and the bride. <clears throat> um, 
so we've been talking about how this Galilean wedding is tied directly to the Passover. Um, the bread and the cup, you have it during marriage, and then you have this bread and the cup during the Passover. Um, and we know that it was done at a betrothal, that only the father knows the day and the time, and scripture even says that only the father will know the day and the time. Um, so another question, Passover is also known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, you know, bread was eaten without yeast because they were to flee quickly uh, on that night of escaping Egypt. Uh, and we also know that bread represents the body of Christ, which is broken for us. Um, it's without yeast, it's without leaven, it's without sin, um, purposefully. So why is there yeast allowed in the wine? Like why not drink just grape juice that day uh, and not fermented uh, wine, uh, fer fermented grape juice, which is wine? Well, we know that the wine equals blood, right? Um, it tells us that in scripture. And we know that blood, it actually covers sin. So the yeast, that sin, that is in wine that should make it rot, that should make it turn into death normally. It actually is transformed and it's turned into life, uh, a, a different flavor, something that you can't get out of normal grape juice. Um, so it's, you know, blood, it covers sin, but um, the body, it has to be without sin. There has to be a substitution that takes place. So Jesus's body, which is without sin, the bread, the Passover bread, the unleavened bread, which is without sin, it takes the place that, that pure, a yeastless body of Christ, which is broken for us. Um, it takes the place for us. It does a substitution uh, for the sin and the death, the wages of sin, of, which is death that we deserve. And instead, um, we are able to be transformed um, through that blood. Um, that sin that normally should corrupt us and should kill us uh, because the wages of sin is death. It actually we are able to be transformed by that, by the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are a new creation uh, in him, through him. And we know that the father is one with the son and the son is one with the bride um, who is us, who is sanctified through him. So all these things, they tie into uh, the bread, the wine, the betrothal and Passover. And brother Charles, he talked about how, um, there's a difference in the gospels and the, the verses that he pointed out when he first pointed out this to me, I was so wowed. Um, <laughs> it's so simple and so beautiful that the group of Luke repeatedly, it says you, it, it's for you do this. Uh, you know, this is my body, which is given for you. Uh, you know, do this in remembrance of me. Um, this cup is a new Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And over here, uh, it doesn't say for you, it, it says for many. Uh, over here, it says for many, for the remission of sins. Um, and you see this pattern between Luke, Mark, and Matthew, where if you get the green, you can compare the green together, and then the blue together, and the red together, and the yellow together. And we're going to focus on a few of these to um, point out some additional differences that actually point to more and more to Passover than we might even realize. <clears throat> so in Luke, what does it say? For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Uh, and this is, is, is said pretty much in all three gospels. Verily I say unto you, I will not drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it in you in the kingdom of God. Same with Matthew, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And we know that the Galilean wedding, we just told you, what do they say? What does the groom say at the wedding? You are now consecrated to me by the laws of Moses, and I will drink it again anew with you in my father's house. And we know that the father's house is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it's the kingdom of God. And so in the father's house in heaven, we will be um, having this um, marriage uh, consummation, this consecration fulfilled at this time. And when does this happen? This is a Passover event where Jesus is talking about Passover in all three of these events. And the Galilean wedding, you repeat the exact same things um, uh, in, the, in the red portions. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And then for Mark, it says, which is shed for many. And for Matthew says, shed for many for the remission of sins. And as Brother Charles pointed out, um, for the bride, we know that it's us, it's you mentioned specifically for the group of Mark, it's for many, because there are people um, at that time, um, some who will remain asleep and some who will wake up. 
And then we know for uh, Matthew's group, for the, Jew, for the Jewish people, um, they haven't actually asked for forgiveness before. Uh, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah at this point, and they won't going into the tribulation. So there has to be a special remission for sin for them. And Brother Charles also mentioned that as well. Um, now, there's a few other things in here. Uh, I wanted to, to uh, repeat this portion just so we can build upon this next thing that's coming up. If you read these other portions, <clears throat> Luke is the only verse where it says, uh, take the bread, give thanks, break it, uh, gave it unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Uh, this do in remembrance of me. It's the only one, the only verse in this in these three passages that talks about uh, this do in remembrance of me um and this also talks about how in luke how this body is given for us right and we know that the body is the body of jesus christ but we are also talked about as the body um the bride um and the the lord jesus christ he mentioned specifically this betrothal ritual at this time and he's saying, do this in remembrance of me. So why would he say to do this in remembrance of me at this time? Well, it's just like an anniversary day for a married couple or for a boyfriend or girlfriend or a person who's engaged. On the engagement day, right, they decided to have this in, uh, betrothal ritual on this engagement day, which is on Passover, where you have the wine together and you, you break the bread together. And it says, do this in remembrance of me. It's the only time that Jesus says to do, some, do this day in remembrance of me repeated in perpetuity and it happens to be on the passover day and on this passover day what are you doing you are eating of the bread and drinking of the wine even though jesus isn't there when he's away from you because you're remembering the anniversary day that you were betrothed together and it's the anniversary day of when you're looking forward to the consummation and the fulfillment of that marriage to come in the future and as brother charles said that this fulfillment will be seen of the passover of it the passover in heaven in the future. So we're looking for a Passover day in the future. And this also points to it being a Passover day in the future because it says, do this in remembrance of me because only Luke, the bride, they will remember because they are the true bride. They're the, the true betrothed and they will remember their anniversary day, just like a true spouse, a true betrothed, the true engaged will remember their wedding day more than any other people who will forget that day if it's not important to them. And, uh, you know, Mark and Matthew's group, they are not looking expectantly for the groom to come. Uh, they are not preparing. They're, they're not remaining chaste. They're being caught up in the world in this prosperity gospel. And because of that, um, they're not told to do this act uh, in remembrance of Jesus Christ. Because even if you were to do it, it would just be a ritual. Um, you wouldn't know the true purpose of, of, of why you're doing the act. And you're not looking for the true groom to show up at any time. You're just going through, through, through the motions. But in Luke's group, do this in remembrance of me because you will remember. You are the ones who are supposed to remember. You are the bride of Christ. This is your anniversary day when the original betrothal was made and a fulfillment of that betrothal is going to come. <clears throat> and we talked about how the Galilean wedding ceremony usually happens one year after the betrothal, um, where there's a future supper, a celebration, consummation, uh, where you have wine again, where you break the bread again, uh, where those vows are renewed. Um, and we are told to remember the night of the Passover and to observe it in the future uh, by Jesus Christ during this Passover supper that we're supposed to remember, observe, and look for this day in the future to be a day that we're supposed to watch. <clears throat> and so uh, what I want to do today is tie this all back to the Old Testament to make this a bigger thing than just... Um, uh, a, a one one part of the Bible uh, verse taken out of context. So um, Abraham and, and Passover, this is uh, one of the original places where a, a, a Passover takes place. Um, and it's the beginning of what I believe is the uh, Jewish wedding process where first the parents come together and they make an agreement between their future children getting married and they enter into covenant together to say that our families are gonna become one, that we will be like that in perpetuity. And we have a covenant together. And then in the future, those those children end up getting married, uh, you know, you know, starting from them being born up until the age of 13, 14, uh, where they have the betrothal, uh, which is the renewing first of that 13 year ago agreement between the parents, then the actual betrothal that happens at year 13, and then on 14, the fulfillment and consummation and the wedding supper that happens afterwards. 
Well, I um, want to tie this all back together and say that the exact same happening thing is happening with God and with us. Um, Abraham and Passover, Exodus, it says, that time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And what do we know happened on that very day where the hosts of the Lord went out of Egypt? Well, it was the Passover day where Moses took all of the Israelites out after the, uh, the plagues that happened uh, and the angel of death came upon the firstborn. And that is when on Passover, 430 years before, there was a covenant that was made with Abraham that for 400 years, your children uh, you, is going to be, they're going to be a stranger uh, in a foreign land. And so you have um, that covenant that was made 430 years to that very day, which means it was also on a Passover. So this covenant saying that you will have future children as many as the stars that you see, um, that came on a Passover day. And uh, what does God say about this Passover day? Exodus 12, 40 through 40, uh, Exodus 12, 42. And it was a night of watching by the Lord. This was when the first Passover was implemented in Exodus 12, uh, when they're about to leave Egypt, the very first night. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So the same night, is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. This is the only night in the Bible that is told to be the night of watching kept by the people of Israel throughout all of their generations. And we talked about this a year ago in um, you know, so many of the videos that we point that pointed to Passover uh, for 2021. But I feel like we're coming full circle to realize that all those things point to uh, even a greater fulfillment of the Passover that's here right now. And Brother Charles went into so many details about um, the, the, the tetrads um, and the reasons why it's this coming year, uh, along with the 70 years, um, 71st year, all being tied together. And um, <clears throat> knowing that it has to be a Passover event in the future, and all of these significant events uh, in our lives tied to the Lord, uh, even going back to Abraham, we're, we're tied to Passover. Uh, I can't see any other day besides Passover being the time when the Lord would come. Uh, in Luke 22, it says, uh, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So there's one day that God, the father specifically names as a night of watching. And that's in the old Testament. And that's Passover. The first moment that Passover is implemented. He said that that is a night of watching throughout all of generations for Israel. Um, the second night, is there's one day that Jesus, um, the son specifically mentions as a night of remembrance, a night of ritual remembrance that you should, you should um, you know, put it on your heart to remember this day and do it every single time. That's the Passover. He says, do this in remembrance of me. He doesn't say to do that, do something else in the remembrance of him. He doesn't say, uh, do something about tabernacles in remembrance of him. He doesn't say, I'll make a new covenant with you on tabernacles for, for something, he does it on Passover. He does it with the disciples on Passover at this betrothal ceremony, which uh, is tied to the Last Supper. So this Passover night, it's continually throughout scripture, a night of covenant, and then a night of fulfillment of that original covenant, which is two parts, just like a wedding. So even uh, right here, we see a covenant that happens and then a fulfillment that happens in the future. And we know that a covenant happens with a betrothal in a wedding, and then you have a fulfillment of that with the wedding sup uh, supper and the ceremony. And even in the church, um, the, the Christian church, the ecclesia, what do people celebrate? They, they do things like baptism and they do the Eucharist, right? The uh, Holy Communion. And you do the Holy Communion on Passover, usually. Um, Passover has to do with Holy Communion. Uh, it, and that is a repeating of this exact same um, commandment that Jesus gives for us to uh, do this throughout generations. And God tells us that this is also a night of watching throughout all generations as well. So, you know, even within the church, even if they completely misunderstood the importance of this and aren't doing it for the right reasons or are blind, um, it is built into the truth of this um, Passover celebration is considered significant, even in Christian and Catholic culture. Uh, and even in, in 
and even in Jewish culture. So it's just something that, that we should observe that it points us to um, the fulfillment that's going to happen in the future. And I don't really know of any churches. Uh, I don't know of any ecclesia, Catholic churches that really do much on tabernacles or go into much detail at tabernacles. And I think there's a reason for that. Not that, you know, Satan is doing things uh, for that, uh, uh, although there is a lot of things, but the main thing is that it should be a Passover event that we should be looking for. And I think that truth prevails uh, even within the church, despite the great deception that's happened within it. So we've been talking about how there's Passover in the Old Testament, there's Passover in the time of Jesus tied to the marriage, tied to this covenant. And if it were to all tie together, it should be um, showing a revelation Passover type event. Well, I'm gonna talk about that right now. Well. Is there a future Revelation Passover event? Let's look at Revelation 5 and 6. When me and Brother Charles were going over this yesterday, we were just having so much fun just, uh, you know, going into scripture, um, seeing what, what the word is defining and, and, and what it's showing us. And in Revelation 5, 6, it says, And be, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain as it had been slain. And we taught this a year ago that this looks like it's a Passover event, that the lamb is there as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So here we see perfection repeated twice, seven horns, seven eyes. Um, horns can be for kingdoms, for, for kingship, uh, royalty, eyes. Uh, right here, it, it tells us it's the spirits of God. Um, and it's very interesting that it's a lamb that was slain here because if it if if Jesus were always in this lamb that were slain mode all the time, um, we would always see him in that mode. But we actually do not see him uh, represented as a lamb that was slain in the beginning of Revelation, and we're gonna get to that in a little bit. Um, but this lamb that was slain directly tells us that it's tied to Passover because Exodus twelve it talks about how your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take up the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So this reference is clearly talking about a slain lamb, the Passover lamb, a perfect Passover Pesach uh, slain lamb, uh, you know, with the seven and seven, the fullness, the completeness of that lamb. Uh, and we know that it's a, a lamb that is without sin, that is perfect, that died for, for the sins, the ways of sin. Um, and so interestingly enough, and now in Revelation, um, that original covenant, which was made on Passover, um, we're looking for it to have a future Passover implication, a fulfillment in the future. And here in Revelation, we see this lamb that was slain in Revelation 5 playing out exactly where you would expect it to be, a Passover event um, right before the tribulations or around the time of the tribulations in Revelation when everything is about to start and, uh, you know, everything is about to be unlocked and unleashed. <clears throat> and we know that this pattern that we see uh, when we talk about Passover happening on earth, there's also a Passover happening in heaven at the exact same time. In Exodus 25, 40, it, it talks about how Moses, uh, and look that thou make them after their pattern, which was shewed thee in the mount. And this is talking about the construction of the tabernacle. Moses pretty much followed all the patterns that God showed him of the true tabernacle and the true kingdom um, that is in heaven. And he followed that same pattern uh, from high priests to watchmen to gatekeepers to everything, all of that was eventually transferred over to by, by Moses and King David, uh, and put that same pattern uh, that was that was shown to them uh, beforehand. In Hebrews eight one through five, it says, "Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum: we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the Majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched." pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, 
that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed in the, to thee in the mount. Um, so we see here that these feast days, the offerings, this, these, this earthly high priest that is put into motion with Aaron and the Levites, it's a shadow of the things to come, of the high priest, Jesus Christ, who is in heaven, of the, the, the sacrifice that's made on heaven and earth um, with this Passover lamb, um, with these festivals that are celebrated year in, year out on God's calendar. And what else do we see um, right after that verse in, in the beginning of Revelation 5 that talks about the, the lamb that was slain? What else do we see here? It says, and he came and took the book, which is um, the book of life. And we're going to go into that in a little bit. Took the book out of the right hand of him and sat upon the throne. And we had taken the book, the four beasts and four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, and thou was slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made unto us our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So here, again, the mention of being a royal priesthood. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand, ten thousand, and the thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the land that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So this day in heaven, Jesus is that perfect Passover lamb that was slain. And he is opening up the seals at this same day of this perfect Passover lamb uh, being slain. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb and shall be the foundation of from the foundation of the world. So we see from this verse that this is this book of life. Um, that is referenced and being opened. And we're looking for our names to be on there. And if you go back, back to our previous videos, we talk about how um, the seals that were opened, it has to do with um, opening seals to an official legal document in a court of law. Um, there's always, there's seven seals that lock something with seven witnesses that give proof to their seals that what is in that document is true. Uh, and the kinsman redeemer, the person who owns that document, that book of life, that scroll or that tome, that book, they are the ones who have the legal right to uh, to open it and to um, show people that they are the rightful heir of the property or the people or the slaves or or the family members that are in that um, scroll. And we see that that perfect kinsman redeemer quality happening through Jesus Christ saving us all, uh, taking back his his wife, taking back his property, the kingdom of earth that was passed over to Satan because the wages of sin were death. And Adam and Eve gave up their kingdom to the beast system, the snake, a beast who began to rule uh, and was listened to outside of God, the father who they should have been listening to. And so you have this um, taking back of this kingdom that takes place. And all this happens around this time of Passover, because this is a lamb that was slain. And in heaven, this lamb that was slain, we don't make sacrifices anymore, but that lamb that was slain in perpetuity is there as a high priest, that sacrifice that works forever. So Jesus does not need to die again, does not need to be slain again. And uh, one thing I want to point out is, like I said earlier, in Revelation 5, Jesus is depicted as a lamb that was slain. But in the beginning of Revelation, he is not depicted as a lamb that was slain. It says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man, clothed with garment down to the foot and grit about the paps with a golden girdle. His head on his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So when Jesus, he appears to John on Patmos, he's actually like a son of man. It doesn't say anywhere here that he is, you know, a, a slain lamb, this perfect Passover sacrifice. Uh, it's only in Revelation 4, 1, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, in this moment, he was, everything was changed and he was before the throne. A throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And so in this moment is when he's transported and he's put into the throne room. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ 
is the Passover perfect sacrifice, the Pesach, the Pesach lamb. So this, this literally points to a separation or a difference that's happening in Revelation 4, that this is clearly a, in heaven, it is the Passover right now uh, in Revelation 5, uh, and probably starting from Revelation 4, and even, maybe even before that. Um, and it talks about how in Exodus 25, 40, and Hebrew 8, 5, Hebrews 8, 5, where we, where we just read that there's a pattern in heaven that everything on earth is following. Uh, and we know that the Lord's prayer is, you know, our father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the same thing is happening where Moses, he saw this pattern, you know, on earth, on, on, in heaven, and he's making on earth as it is in heaven. You know, that's the will of God. And interestingly enough, if we were to fit this into the pattern that we've seen throughout history, the pattern that we're seeing in the book of Revelation, the pattern that happens during Passover, um, what happens at this time, right? What happens the moment this perfect Passover sacrificial lamb in Revelation 5 decides to open the seals, open the book? Well, the tribulations happen. It's Passover, then tribulations immediately to follow. You know, it's like a one-two punch. They're, they're connected together. And what's the first Passover pattern uh, in the book of Exodus when they're leaving Egypt? So Egypt is judged. The firstborn is judged and they're not passed over by the blood of Christ, by the angel of death, not by the blood of the lamb. Um, there is no blood. And so all of the Egyptians, they're punished uh, and their children are killed um, that night, uh, the firstborn. And the children of God, instead for them, they um, have the angel of death pass them over because of the blood of the lamb and they escape at that same time. So you have escape and judgment happening at the same exact time that you have this firstborn of God and this firstborn of Satan, both experiencing, you know, a, a, you know, a, a miraculous or um, life changing event at the same time. Uh, we talked about this midnight cry in this Galilean wedding. Well, the, when the father tells the groom to go get his, his bride, um, there's a midnight cry. They scream, they shout, they blow shofars and they go get, to, they go get the bride. Well, there was actually a midnight cry during the Passover in Exodus. It says, and it came to pass that at midnight, the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne and unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord, and ye as ye have said. And Pharaoh sends them all out because he can't take in more. And, and so you have this midnight cry on Passover. You have this midnight cry during a Galilean uh, ancient Israel wedding. And it happens at that same time where a good thing is going to happen. And in, in this point, a bad thing is going to happen too. Judgment is going to happen at the same time. The, the joy of the wedding and the judgment of, of the world of Egypt, of Sodom, the spiritual Egypt, the spiritual Sodom, uh, which we know in the future is Jerusalem, which becomes corrupt and, in, and it is already corrupt and has not repented of the sins during these last 70 years, as Brother Charles has talked about. And now I'm going to tie this all back to Abraham, because we know that Abraham is the father of our faith. He is the um, you know, the, uh, the original one who made the covenant with uh, God the Father um, for the future generations to come. And uh, what does it say in Genesis, Gen Genesis 15? It says, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels, shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, unto him so shall thy seed be and later in genesis 15 it says and when the sun was going down a deep sleep fell upon abram and lo a horror of great darkness fell upon him and he said unto abram know of surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years and we know that um, in exodus later it talks about how this very day. So that means this whole portion, portion that I'm reaching, reading to you from Genesis 15 actually happens to be on the Passover day, the first time that Jesus, that God makes a covenant about there being a future seed uh, for Abraham and how it's going to be connected to God in perpetuity between their two houses. 
Genesis 15, 17 through 18, it says, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces, which are the two pieces of the split apart sacrifices. And so the burning lamp, the furnace, the fire, it went in between, it passed over those sacrifices. And in that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt into the great river, the river Euphrates. And as I said, Exodus 12, 40, it says, the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So we have this Passover day where you have Abraham, the father of everyone's faith, uh, the ones making a covenant uh, with God the Father um, about the future generations that um, you will have future offspring and I will have a relationship with that future offspring. <clears throat> and um, as we said earlier, this, this day, it's, it's the only night of watching by the Lord, uh, as we saw in Exodus. Um, so we know that the Israelites were watching for this day and their next generations are supposed to keep watching for that day. And who are the generations of Israel? They are the sons of Abraham, the children of Abraham. They're supposed to be watching for this day, um, the day when this covenant was made um, by two fathers for their future children to get married and have relationships together and bringing those houses together. Um, Luke 22 talks about, do this in remembrance of me. Remember, so we're doing this in remembrance, the same exact day, the Passover, do it in remembrance of me. And we prove to you how in Revelation 5, this is also a Passover event when we're looking for a future fulfillment, when we will escape all of these things. Um, one thing I wanted to show is that there wasn't just one covenant that was made with Abraham, uh, but there was multiple covenants that were made, but they were like a renewing of that original covenant. Um, the, the first covenant uh, was the one that we just read before from Genesis 15. Um, and that one didn't actually specifically mention Isaac at that point. But when Abraham turns 99, um, there is a covenant and a promise, a covenant of circumcision that is made. And I'm going to prove to you that I believe that this is also during the Passover. And it makes sense that another, the, another promise, the second promise of fulfillment of you having children and offspring, as many as you can count, um, as many as the stars in the sky, that it would be on the same day um, th as the original promise that was made. And the future fulfillment of that actually happening after that promise also should be on that same day. And the future, future, future promise of that being fulfilled also would happen on that Passover day. And it says on Genesis 17, it says, and God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, uh, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So the only true requirement for Passover, it, it's supposed to be observed by strangers uh, in the land, for, for, by everybody that, that is with you. But the only requirement is that all of them have to be circumcised. So this circumcision actually has to do with Passover because you cannot observe the Passover without being circumcised. And also, um, if you go to Joshua, uh, Joshua is after the wilderness period and they enter into the promised land later, which is also um, you know, an illusion to what's supposed to happen of us entering into the promised land and of the Jews entering into the promised land um, and escaping Israel at the original Passover. Well, it, in Joshua 5, um, this is after the 40 years in the wilderness, they're uh, going into Jericho and about to enter into the promised land and says, and it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal until this day. And the children of Israel and Captain Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. So Passover, it has to do with circumcision. Even the Israelites, they're circumcised again after those 40 years at the time of Passover. Um, Abraham, when he's given the original covenant, they're given the covenant of circumcision. And I believe that is on Passover. And when Isaac comes again, one year later, he's born um, exactly on that day. I believe it happens on the Passover day. And if you go back even to the video that we have from 
um, you know, about a year ago that goes into the Passover. We have a few other historical contexts where everything from, um, you know, Cain and Abel all the way down to um, things that happen with in the book of Daniel, there's so many Passover implications throughout scripture from, uh, you know, the, we say it's the God of Isaac, Jacob, of Abraham. Well, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, they all have Passover moments if you look closely in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> And so this covenant between houses, Abraham's covenant with God, that there will be a union between both houses in perpetuity forever. Abraham's children plus God's son equals a future wedding commitment between the parents on Passover. It's a Passover covenant and they promise of Isaac one year later, Isaac born on Passover, Jesus' wedding proposal on Passover at the Last Supper and him saying that it will be fulfilled at a future event in heaven on Passover, and we see that happening in Revelation 5. In a wedding, you do the renewing of the vows, you do a consummation, you do a feast and a celebration, and this is all going to be on Passover, just as all the other events have been on Passover before this. And so that we know that this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. And what does it say? Our, our main verse that we, they, that we talk about in, in this uh, sort of God ministry all the time, Luke 21, 36, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And this watching, this most important night of watching for the people of God throughout all generations is this Passover night. Yep, uh, that's all for my portion. Uh, you know, just want to say that the, the things that Charles talked about in that first half, he's completely right. There's a fulfillment of these things that play out throughout scripture in the Old Testament repeatedly through, throughout all the major and minor prophets, um, and also in the Gospels, and also going into the book of Revelation and into the future. And I think it's just so beautiful how God ties all these things together. Um, and he shows us clearly these definitions and these ties and the symbolism um, that's so easy to understand if we just taking the context of the correct verses. Um, yeah, uh, Brother Charles, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thanks so much for the time, guys. God bless you. And uh, yeah, we'll do some uh, open mic discussion from here. Thank you, dear Brother Wu. That that was absolutely Holy Spirit filled, Holy Spirit led, and just, just absolutely just wonderfully done. You know, dear brother, we, we talked about a lot of that stuff last night and it just, <clears throat> It just really goes to show how the Holy Spirit leads you because you you were able to put that together so quickly and so very decisively, you know, and, and you really brought up, you know, a, a, a lot of the finer points of, of what I was teaching and you just really brought it all together, you know, especially with, you know, the, the important part here, to, well, all of it was important, but, you know, the, the part that I, I, I enjoyed too was when you went through the whole Galilean wedding thing because <clears throat> I really want to emphasize this with everybody about, about what Brother Wu really did. You got to understand something. <clears throat> we are the bride of Christ. We, the ones who are watching this video right now, we, the ones who are watching and looking and waiting and, and praying uh, diligently, uh, searching out our Lord and Savior. We, we're the ones with the eyes open, the ears open. We are waiting for our Lord and Savior to come and take us, his bride, off the face of this earth. And, and understand the importance of what Brother Wu and I are teaching you. You know, especially this part where Brother Wu was bringing in the Galilean wedding. It's so critical that you understand that. What's happened is this. I, I, I'm going to just share my screen for a moment and just show you what, um, what we're referring to and why it's important for Brother Wu, uh, Wu's part of the teaching when he brought in the Galilean wedding. Because what's happening right here? What's happening right here in, in Luke 22, 19 to 22, 20? And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you do this in remembrance of, of me likewise also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new testament remember we said this is the covenant new testament means covenant this is the new testament new covenant in my blood which is shed for you he's making the covenant with the bride and the you the for you is you the bride which is only said in luke and we know luke is light and luke is written to the bride of christ so he is making the proposal the proposal is happening right here. There is a proposal and a covenant being made. 
the groom makes the covenant with the bride. And and, and brother, we'll fill me in on this. So so let's let's walk through the the, the ceremony of, of the bride and groom in the Galilean wedding. So the bride and the family bring forth the covenant. Is that is that correct? Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how it happens and how how does the bride accept the covenant? Can you can you go over that with us a little bit? Um yeah. Uh I don't know if I should share my screen. I guess I could. Are you gonna be sharing your screen? Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> Yeah, there's a there's a marriage covenant that's made first. Uh, you know, the engagement party, pretty much. Uh, right. It, it originally happens with between the parents first, and then it's you know played out through the children, uh, and then you have this purchase price that needs to be paid, which is like, you know, the the body which is you know broken for us, paid for us. Um, you have this ritual cleansing. You have this preparation of the house. Um, this midnight cry where the bridegroom goes out to get his bride. And then you have this wedding ceremony that comes together at the very end uh, that pieces everything together. Um, <clears throat> but that's what it makes so much sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. It makes so much sense that it's a two, two part process. It, it confuses a lot of people when it says, um, you know, the voice of, of the bridegroom won't be there or the bride and the groom. Um, we are already the bride. So we're not waiting for a future part where we become the bride because right, right now we're just engaged. We are actually the bride already. You're already married to 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 God, to Jesus Christ. Um, you know, betrothed to Him. Uh, now we're just going through the next process. So, so yeah. So let's walk through that in just <clears throat> a couple more steps. So, so the covenant is made at the covenant. The contract is made at the at the at the at the betrothal at, at the part where he's he's um proposing to the bride. But they're they're not. They're, it's not the wedding ceremony yet, but the, but they're making the covenant, and it's between the families, and it's between the groom, right? And yeah. so, and so then, what does the groom do? Uh, he, he hands the bride the cup. Is that correct? And and what? Ha how does she accept the covenant? What is what does the bride got to do to accept the covenant from the groom? It's a very yeah, so thing. they have to drink from the same cup, just like a That's real right. family member would. Like if there's like if there were poison in there, then you would right. both drink it together and both die together. That, that's pretty much what it means. If there were poison in the bread, um, you would both be eating it and you would both be willing to die. So you trust each other as true family, um, as one, where you'll eat the same food and drink the same uh, wine together, even from the same cup, because you are family. So the um, in the betrothal, the groom. <laughs> passes the cup to the bride and the bride can either accept the cup or reject the cup. If she accepts it and drinks from it, she passes it back to, to the groom. And that means that she accepts her portion of the betrothal and the groom, he drinks from that cup. And basically he says the, you are now consecrated to me by the laws of Moses. And I'll drink it again anew with you in my father's house, which happens a year later uh, where they consecrate that marriage. Um, and before that, if either the bride refuses it, uh, and doesn't give it to the groom, then the marriage is, is is off. They're not betrothed. And if the groom, he were to take the cup from, from the bride and then not drink from it, then it would also be annulled as well. It wouldn't be an actual wedding. So they both have the opportunity to reject this cup. Um, but, you know, in the end, they, they, they do not. And I, that kind of makes me wonder, like, you know, it, in Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, take this cup from me. Well, what is this cup? This cup is the cup of betrothal um, that you drink with the with the bride, and he knows that in order to go through that, he has to die for for the bride um, on her behalf. And exactly. he, he asks, "Is it possible to take this cup from me?" But he knows that he needs to take it for the sake of the bride and for the kingdom um, to to be one with the bride and to be one with the father and to to die for the bride and to resurrect for the bride also. Um, exactly. And th that brings me to my point. Can I, can I share my screen for a moment, please? You're, you're bringing it right to the point that we need to bring this. So this is this is awesome, brother. This, you know, this is just great that you and I are really, you know, t teaching the exact same thing and 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 coming to, to the very same conclusion. See what Brother Wu is talking about is there is a cup. There is a cup being given to the bride. Right. And, and, th and this is what's happening in this story. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He's giving them the cup to drink. He's making the covenant. This cup, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. 
And he also says, this is my body, which is given for you. He's giving his body to us. Why? Because Jesus Christ is telling us he's going to die for us. I'm giving my body for you. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to shed my blood. This cup, this covenant, this is what brother was talking about. He's now, Jesus Christ is now giving the cup to you to drink because you are the bride. Isn't that what brother who's been talking about? The bridegroom gives the cup to the bride. Even willing to die for her. He's making his covenant unto her. If the bride drinks of the cup, then she accepts the marriage proposal. So the last supper, what we're looking at here in Luke, is literally the marriage proposal. It is the type and shadow of the marriage proposal. Jesus Christ literally is proposing to you, the bride. He's giving you the cup of the covenant. His blood, his blood shed is the covenant for you. He's going to die for you. He's telling us he's going to give his body for us. He's going to shed his blood for us. And if we drink of this cup, of this covenant, if we drink of that cup, he's shedding it for you. You accept the marriage proposal. And this is exactly what we're seeing. Brothers and sisters, the Galilean wedding is being shown to us right here in the Last Supper. And this proposal, this marriage proposal, this covenant, like Brother Wu said, there's two parts to it. There's, there's the actual part where the covenant is made, and then the covenant needs to be kept. And that's on the marriage day. And when does Jesus tell us in here when this will be fulfilled? When will the keeping of the covenant be fulfilled? On Passover. Drop the mic. It's mm -hmm. all here. What were you saying, Brother Wu? Oh, yeah, I was just saying amen. Yes. The, the entire covenant is being made here for the bride, for you. But notice it's not happening in, in Mark and it's not happening here in, in Matthew. Nowhere in here is he telling us that this New Testament is for you. It's, he's saying it's for many. And those many that he's talking about are those who come through tribulation. It's nonspecific. What were you saying to me about this yesterday, brother, about about the the you being very specific and and the many being non-specific, you, you you were talking quite a bit about that yesterday. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, you mentioned this too uh, in parts of your portion. How you know you is very personal. It it yes. lets it you you know who's being addressed. It's that reader, right? But starting from Mark and Matthew, they're not addressing the re the reader. They're not. That's right. They're not talking directly to you or the person that's reading it. They're saying that it's. For many, um, and maybe you're included in that many. And then with the Matthew group, it makes complete sense that it adds the remission of sins, as you said, because um, the Jews they don't they don't believe in a messianic uh, Jesus Christ. They believe that the Messiah hasn't come yet. Um, and every Passover, they actually have um, a separate cup of wine that they put out. That's called the cup of Elijah, like a fourth cup. At that's the, right at the supper and that is for elijah that they believe will come during the passover and they always say elijah will come before jesus christ and it happens to be a malachi uh passover event that they believe that, that that'll be taking place so even the jews believe that jesus christ will be coming as the the messiah on a passover that's right that's absolutely great. so they're they're so they're expecting the fulfillment of passover on passover literally yeah. And, and 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 they don't know how right they are. Yeah. It's in true. fact, we Christians should understand how right they are about that aspect. That Passover can only be fulfilled on Passover. Yeah. This is why they're putting the extra place setting at their table on Passover, because they're expecting their Messiah. And they're expecting him on Passover. And and we, the Christians, are are are, are wandering around scratching our heads, you know, all these last few years and, and thinking of this day and that day. And 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 it's right in front of us. Yeah, everything Our seems Lord. to be pointing to Passover. I don't, I don't know how if Passover passes to say that this is going to be fulfilled on a different day. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, so that, that that's what I was saying earlier in the video. So if anybody's reading this, how do you unsee this anymore? You can never unsee this. It's clear, crystal clear. The Passover was never fulfilled. And our Lord and Savior is telling us it will be fulfilled. The Passover will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God for you. The covenant will be com completed on Passover. How do you unsee that? Yeah. I mean, there, there's these partial fulfillments and these multiple fulfillments that are taking place. But the ultimate fulfillment 
that's talked about in that verse says that it's going to be in the kingdom of heaven. That's right. And we see that happening uh, in Revelation where, the, you know, the actual marriage ceremony and everything happens uh, later in Revelation. So, yeah, it's it's so clear and so true. Um, I mean, I don't know how to change that definition because it's based on scripture. That's right. Yeah, it, it, it's clear. See, that, that that's what brother when I were talking <clears throat> about late, late last night, too, is, you know, like I said, once you see this, you can't unsee it. How can anyone see this? And then start teaching about a different date. Yeah. You can't. It's over. And 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 and, and I have a lot of respect for our other brothers and sisters out there who, who have their own ministries. But I implore you, brothers and sisters, who, who are watching this video right now. Wh whatever date they're teaching you cannot be right anymore. It can't be. It's virtually impossible. Because the Passover will be fulfilled on Passover. In our Lord and Savior's own words. So any other date that you're watching and following is false. I'm going to come straight out and say it. It's false. It can never be fulfilled on those days. The word of our Lord and Savior is true now and always. Unto eternity. This can never be changed. Passover will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God on Passover. So I implore all of you, if you're watching any of their videos from other, some other ministries and they're making up dates and making up their own calendars and, and guessing wildly or pretending, whatever they're doing, please show them these verses. Stand strong, stand firm, show them these verses. Keep your faith in the word of our Lord and Savior. He will fulfill this covenant on Passover in the kingdom of heaven. This can never be changed. Yeah. Virtually impossible. It, it, there, and it has to be uh, consistent throughout scripture. It can't right. be like one verse that we take out of context. It's literally from, from the covenant made with Abraham to the laws in the book of Moses, uh, right. to the Levitical, Levitical laws. Um, that has to correlate all the way down into, you know, what Jesus Christ builds on top of that as they, because he's the fulfillment of all of these things. That's right. Um, just even by coming and by existing. And then he will be the true ultimate fulfillment of those things in the future uh, in the book of Re Revelation that we know he's our kinsman redeemer for, for all the things that he needs to redeem. Well, yeah. And, and then, and see, here, here's another thing too. Let's go into, um, let's go into Acts real quick. We, we, we've put this in several of our videos and, 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 and we just don't realize how right we've been about this. What, what does it say in the book of Acts about the return of, of our Lord and Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach. What does it say? Yeah, It's right here. Like this, this, this is right when our Lord and Savior is about to be ascending into heaven. And what does it say? And while they look steadfastly toward heaven, as, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in, shine, in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in a like manner as you see him go into heaven. He's coming back on Passover. The, the, the two witnesses are telling us he's going to come back the same way he left. And, and we taught this many, many times last year. And now, once again, it's proving to be absolutely correct. We're being told by the two witnesses that he's coming back. And, and, and in his own words, in, in our Lord and Savior's own words, he's telling us, when he's coming back to fulfill the Passover in the kingdom of heaven on Passover. Yeah. And there's only three times that you, that people are, the men are supposed to appear before the Lord. And that's, that's right. That's right. Passover, tabernacles and Pentecost. So. Amen, brother. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So you were talking about, um, here, I'll bring it up. You, you were talking about access. This is, this is very interesting. And I know you made the point, but I want to emphasize this because it's, it's really a great point that you were making. And you talked to me about this very late last night, too. And, and it just it just blew my mind how you brought this up. You see, th this whole thing in. Um, in oh, that my sorry. The screen got to another screen there. So, OK, so we're, we're in Exodus 12 and it's talking about the Passover. OK, and, and what does God tell him? It's in the first month on the 14th day of the month at even. See, remember I was talking about the evening. It's going to be the evening. It's not in the morning. It's not in the afternoon. It's in the evening. Why? Because now it begins the next day. So on the 14th of the month, 
at eve at even you shall eat unleavened bread until until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. See, so it's a seven day feast. It's a seven. It's one week until when the twentieth day uh, uh, until the one and twentieth day of the month. So so it's seven days from the fourteenth to the twenty first, and it starts at even. And isn't that what we showed, brother Wu, in in the calendar? When we when we bring up the calendar here. Here's the 14th day of Nisan, which lands exactly on April 15th. So the 14th of Nisan is when, when did he say it begins? In the evening. So in the evening time, it now becomes the, the 15th. That's the first day. That's why I said there's a 12 hour difference when you go to, um, when, you, when you look at what we put out for um, the, the timeline and, and we um, look at how, how it's all laid out, what we find is there is a 12 hour difference, okay? This is the updated one. So, so it's eight It's eight years from, from April 15th, 2014 till April 15th, 2022, it's eight years. But then when you go into the evening, it's the 12 hours. And that's why in the Transfiguration story in Luke, it says about an eight days, about eight years. So it's eight years and 12 hours going into the next day. And that's exactly what we find in, in the scriptures, it says. On the first month of the 14th day in the evening. So it's, it begins in the evening hour. And so, brother, you, you made a great point about this. Okay. When is this actual Last Supper taking place? When, when we go to the Last Supper, when is this, brother? When, when, is, it, when is this actual Last Supper occurring? Um, it's the Passover night after. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the evening. Yeah. So, it, so it's the same time. It's the <clears throat> exact same time the Lord's telling this. So it's right here. So it's on the 14th in the evening. Jesus Christ is sitting down with his apostles and celebrating the very beginning of Passover. He's having that first Passover dinner with them. And this is the night he's making his covenant. And what did you just teach everybody about this night? It's the night of what? It's the night of remembrance. And can you go over that a little bit with us again, Brother Wu, about what, what God said about this, this particular night and, and, to, and to be watching? Yeah, I, I, I remember when you pointed out the differences in the Gospels to me yesterday about these things. The, the one thing additionally that stood out was this, do this in remembrance of me. That's or right. Or this do in remembrance of me. And it's, it's literally, when we first noticed it in Luke, we were like, oh man, this is such a, it's such a huge verse. And yeah, I it's, only, it's only in Luke. Yeah. Only in Luke does he say, do this in remembrance of me. And it's we wonder, is it in Mark, Mark and Matthew? Um, it shouldn't be. And then we, we couldn't find it. It wasn't. Um, and, you know, those who have eyes to see, uh, those who have ears to hear. And, and it's those who care enough to remember. Like, these are the people who, this is an anniversary day. It's a significant Passover right. event that has happened since the beginning. It, it's right. like forgetting your anniversary day for your spouse um or your birth the birthday of your child or something there the, the person is going to be like oh you know you should remember this day it's a significant day that's important to, to you two people and it's this engagement day uh which didn't just start you're it, it's it's like it's like saying this it's like saying my parents and my wife's parents they agreed upon a contract and on a certain day let's call it passover and then me and my wife we decide to have our proposal, our engagement on that same Passover day. And then we decide to have our wedding on that Passover day. And our parents are there on that Passover day, knowing right. that, that happened from the beginning. That's the exact same thing that's happening now. This is a Passover day that is significant to God and Abraham, to the children of God, who are the children of Abraham, uh, not the children of Satan. And you go down and this marriage has been planned and contracted in a covenant uh, for, for a long, long, long time uh, through Abraham, and it's continuing. Amen. Yeah, and it, it, it <clears throat> what it's showing is because it's clearly only in, in Luke, you brought up a good point. Who's going to be the one that's remembering this day? Who's he talking to? He's telling the bride, remember this. Remember that I'm giving my body for you. Remember that I'm shedding my blood for you. See, he's yeah. talking to his bride. 
Exactly. And think, think about it. Um, in, in the Catholic Church and in the Christian Church, you do uh, the Eucharist, you do communion because, you know, it's, you're told to do it. But a lot of the, the people in the church, they don't realize that it's a, it's a betrothal. It's a wedding ceremony. It's, it's more than, it, it's about the body and the, the head, the husband and the wife, um, you know, it, it, it's tying all those things together. It's so much more than just a holy communion that you do once a year or some churches do it like once a month. It literally is a marriage ceremony and telling you to look for that marriage consummation and fulfillment in the future. And it's just missed as just ritual, like performance. Amen, brother. And here, here's another finer point that we talked about last night. I, I, I'm so excited. I, I want to bring it into this, this discussion right now. I want everyone to see this part where it says, this is my body, which is given for you. He's telling the bride, he's going to give his body in place of you. He's going to die for you. This is my body, which is given for you. So you don't have to die. He's going to die for you. He's going to shed his blood. This covenant in his blood is for you. He's literally saying that he's going to give up his body for you. So he'll die for you. So his body dies in your place. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. His body dies in your place so you don't have to die. And isn't that what he tells us in Luke 9.27? When you go to Luke 9.27, just before the transfiguration story, the transfiguration story is a type and shadow of, of Passover. And when you go to Luke 9.27, oh, my, my uh, Esau is getting a little stuck. When you go to Luke 9.27, what does he say? But I tell you the truth, there'll be some standing here. Remember, standing means covenant, right? Covenant. Some of you who've taken the covenant here, which shall not taste of death, you're not going to die. And you're going to see the kingdom of God. Why aren't you going to die? He's telling you straight here in his own words. I want this to impact you. These aren't just any words in scripture. Jesus Christ is saying there'll be some standing here. And the standing here is who? Those who took the covenant. I'm pointing to it right down here. Those who took the covenant, right? The one standing here took taking the covenant which shall not taste of death and they will see the kingdom of God. Why won't they, why won't they taste of death? Because he died and gave his body for you. It's right here. This is my body, which is given for you. So he's telling you here in the marriage ceremony, you're not going to die. I'm sorry. In the marriage proposal, you're not going to die. He's going to give his body in place for you. Now watch this. This is so significant. What do we see at the resurrection? And this is something I talked to brother Wu about late last night. Oh, I don't know why my e-sword is so slow right now. Okay, so, okay, so here we are. So now it's upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning. They came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. The bride, this is a type and shadow of the bride not being in the grave you us we are the body of christ didn't he just say here that he's going to give his body for you he's going to die for you and what's happened the body is not found in the grave you the bride dropped the mic the body of christ is not going to the grave that's the type of shadow we're seeing here what do you say brother Wu? Oh yeah, I'm I, I'm totally in agreement. <coughs> Sorry, I, that's, that's okay, me. brother. I know you're not feeling well still. I don't need to make you talk so much tonight. We'll be praying. Everyone, I want everyone to be praying over Brother Wu. He's been having this cough for the last several weeks now, and although it's getting better, it's still lingering. So, uh, please, uh, by the hand of God, all of you, please uh, say some prayers for Brother Wu for his expedient healing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome, brother. So yeah, so the, the body of Christ is not found in the grave. And this is the only, this is the only scripture that says that. Let's go to Mark. What does Mark say? He doesn't say that. It doesn't say there's no body of Christ found. What does it say? And verily in the morning, in the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun and said that among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door? Okay. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. You see? Why, why don't they mention the body of our Lord Jesus was gone and not there? It's only found in Luke. 
because the body of Christ is the bride of Christ. We don't go to the grave. And the same thing with Matthew. You don't see that in Matthew. And in the end of the Sabbath, the beginning as it began to dawn in the first week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary uh, went to the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake that fell upon them. And for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and they sat upon it and, and sat upon it. Read that again. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the stone from the door and sat upon it. Where's the body of Christ? It's not here. Only in Luke. It's only in Luke where we see that the body is gone. And we are the body. We, we are the type and shadow of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Do you see how it's consistent? Every time we show you something in Luke, it's always talking about the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Every time it's consistent. There's no inconsistencies in how we're teaching this. Luke is for the body, the bride of Christ. Mark is for the left behind church. And Matthew is for the left behind Jews. Do you have anything to add to that, uh, Brother Wu, before we move on to the next topic? Oh, no. Uh, I think you did a good job of uh, summarizing that at the end. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's very clear. It's very clear how all this fits together. Now, there was something that you said to me last night that, I mean, Brother Wu and I talked about this for a long time. He said something to me that just spun my head into orbit. It was so, so well done and so well said, you know, and, and, he, and he brought parts of it up here today. But I just want to kind of go over it again because it is, it's just very superbly put together. And I didn't catch this until he told me last night. And I was like, this is just absolutely amazing. It's in Revelation 5. And it's exactly where, where it needs to be. And, and what was the thing here that you were talking about, Brother Wu, about the, the lamb being slain, right? Yeah. It, um, there's literally in Revelation 1, the description of Jesus Christ in Revelation 1, on the island of Patmos, the beloved disciple John, he turns around and he sees uh, like uh, this son of man, this, this figure. But in Revelation 5, the description of Jesus Christ that's given is right actually a lamb that was slain. So it's completely different from the two descriptions. It, it, it proves to you that there's a significance in the reason that there's a description of Jesus Christ. Everything in the Bible is there for a reason. They could have mentioned so many other things, but yes. the vision included the one part where in Revelation 1, Jesus looks one way. One way in Revelation 5, Jesus is a lamb that was slain. And a lamb that was slain with the seven eyes and seven horns, which is completeness and fullness, that has to be a complete and full Passover lamb. Um, and we know that that completeness and fullness is going to be a Passover event every single time. And even though Jesus died and resurrected uh, at that at that Passover, um, in in at at the time when he, when he came on the earth during his ministry, um, there's going to be a future event where that's actually uh, completely fulfilled. <clears throat> Absolutely, you know, and 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 th this was the amazing part. You know, I've read this so many times, and I've always understood that when you when you go to here, we'll go we'll do now. When you go to Revelation four. Uh, again, my my is acting really slow, slow tonight. Maybe a bad connection. When you go to when you go to Revelation four, it's clearly the throne room scene. Anybody who's read this understands this is clearly the throne room scene. Okay, this is where we're in the throne room, and, and the Lord tells us to come up here. There, watch. After this, I looked and beheld a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, "Come up hither." He's calling us to heaven. Okay. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. This is the throne room scene. The bride of Christ is being taken up into heaven. And this is the throne room. Scene. This is the moment we're being called up to heaven. And we are in the midst of the throne room with, with our Lord God. Okay. And so what do we see after this? So actually, let's kind of take a look back. When you go to Revelation 2, when you go to, it's, it's, it's in order. The warnings are going out to the churches. The church of Ephesus is being warned. The church of Smyrna, Smyrna is being warned. All the warnings. The church of Pergamon is being made. So the warnings are going out to the churches. And the same thing in Revelation 3. The warnings are continuing to go out to the churches, right? So once the warnings are gone out, right? Church of Sardis, church of Philadelphia. So there, there's the warnings in Revelation 2 and 3. In Revelation 4, after the warnings are gone out, and the Lord is warning the people in the churches. He's telling them, if you read Revelation 2 and 3 carefully, 
you'll see the Lord and the angel of the Lord is warning the people to come out of the churches because of the false doctrines. And who are those people that are coming out of the churches? The bride. He, the Lord God, if you read Revelation 2 and 3 carefully, what's really going on is the Lord God, our Lord and Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach, the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord, is calling the people out of to come out of the churches, to leave the churches. And he tells us it's because it's the false doctrines they're teaching. So the bride of Christ are the ones being pulled out of the churches. We're being refined. We're not listening to the false doctrines of the churches. We're not listening to the, the customs and, and rituals of the churches. We're following the word of God. And that's why we in this ministry, Brother Wu and I, we teach strictly from the word of God and not the doctrines of the churches, not their rituals, not their customs. We only teach straight from scripture. So the warnings of the churches go out in verses two, uh, chapters two and three for the bride to come out of the church. And the next thing you see when the bride comes out of the church is what? The throne room scene where the Lord God calls the bride up into the throne room, come up hither. And now we're in the midst of God and we're in the midst of the elders. Where? In the throne room. And what's the very next, this is what brother, this is the point brother Wu's trying to make. The very next thing you see in, in heaven, in the throne room is what? There stood a lamb as it had been slain. Why? Brother Wu, when, when you showed this to me yesterday, my head was spinning. Why is this so important, brothers and sisters? Why are they seeing a lamb that's standing there as if it had been slain? Because of this. Because now Passover is being fulfilled on Passover in the throne room in the kingdom of God. Amen. <clears throat> it's clear now. It's clear. They could have had any description of Jesus Christ. They could have said the son of God, the son of man. They could have used the name Jesus. But they, they named him as a lamb, as if he was slain. Why? They're referring back to now we're in the kingdom of God, and the Passover is now being fulfilled with the bride in the throne room. Drop the mic. What say you, uh, uh, Brother Wu? Yeah, uh, I'm on the same page. And um, I, I, I truly believe that those elders are us. Um, that yes, very well could be, yes. They're called the royal priest. They call themselves a royal priesthood. Um, and yes. the royal priesthood in, in, uh, in Peter 2.9, uh, in Revelation 1, um, you know, about the royal priesthood uh, by, by John, uh, it, 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 it fits the definition of, of who the beloved, the bride, they're called the royal priesthood, the, 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 the Levitical priesthood uh, kingship. That's right. <clears throat> and the elders, they describe themselves as being a royal priesthood. And, Amen. Um, Amen. Yeah, we, we have a few other videos uh, that talks about the watchmen and the, the elders and how that points to a pre-tribulation rapture, how we're not in the tribulations just yet. Um, and so if, if people are curious about that, they can always refer to some of our um, older videos. Yeah, and um, I don't mean to go on if, if, you're, um, if your voice is bothering you, brother, if you wanted to... Um continue on we can if not we can we can close the video oh no it, it, it's fine um if you have uh wh whatever you have, oh, I have a lot more things we can discuss yeah, let's, let's keep going let's keep going up I, okay. I think it's a it's a great time of fellowship and okay excellent so let, let's go on so i have these other i have a whole bunch of notes here i mean i have quite a bit actually we could be here for all the rest of the night um but uh <laughs> so you, you know yesterday and and, and, I, and i can't help but notice because it was something that was so impactful you know brother who was talking to me last night about you know how the firstborn of of uh, um, the firstborn of, of the Jews in, in, in Egypt were, were spared on Passover. Okay, and so you know that was the first Passover, and and let's 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 really truly break this down. What happened back in in that time? You know, so brother who was talking to me last night about you know how uh, the Lord had told them to put the blood of the lamb over the doors. Correct? Is that correct, brother Wu? Yeah. That, that's part of the original part of the Passover. So technically, even um, people who observe the Passover now, they're supposed to put the blood right. of the lamb on their doorposts. That's <laughs> right. And so, and so, and so, who was spared? You know, by putting by putting the blood. Of, so this is critical. We, we're gonna we're gonna really dig it deep into this. So, yeah. who was spared by putting the blood over the door? So the the the, the awesome part about all this is it just like I, I know this is the point you're getting at. It's 
it's all tied together, even with the first fruits now. Um, That's right. It was about the the Levitical the Levitical priesthood was about like that the ten percent or you know one of the twelve tribes. That's right. That's right. Um, but the, it was originally about the firstborn uh, before That's the right. Levitical there priesthood uh, in the book of, of the first five books of Moses. Uh, it was a, being the firstborns were consecrated to the Lord. They were the ones who were doing the service and the ministry for the Lord, uh, what the Levites did. But eventually the Levites took that over. Um, but it, it's always been about the firstborn. Um, That's right. Playing out uh, this priesthood uh, for the kingdom of God and them also being the tithe, 10%, the first fruits, just like with an offering. And we are that first fruits offering, that tithe, the bride, that 10%. And, um, you know, we, we see that playing out uh, even in the end times where I, I think it's going to be that 10% that remains the bride who goes first. They're the first fruits, the, the small portion of the, even, even of the ecclesia of the, the, the chosen people. It's the first fruits, the, the tithe, the, the, what you sacrifice and give at the Passover um, so that you can enjoy the rest of the harvest that That's year. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to get into that 10% in just a second. I just want to make a finer point first. You know, it dawned on me when Brother Wu was talking last night. It was such a such a Holy Spirit filled moment when he when he said this. It just, it just dawned on me. And I want everyone to just to just hear what I'm about to tell you. You know, Brother Wu was mentioning, and, and of course, we all know this. We know that the firstborn were, were spared that night and the first Passover, right? The firstborn, now hear me, the firstborn were spared on that night on the first Passover, right? Yeah. So what's now happened? I, I want to correlate it to, to current time. Where are we now? Watch this. Where are we now? Well, right now, we know. We know for a fact that we've just now completed, in 2021, the 70th Passover was completed. And the 70th Tabernacle was completed. And how many years does the Bible tell us are in a generation? 70 years, right? So we know there's 70 years. And so if with strength 80. Yes. So if if Jerusalem, and remember, this is all referring to Jerusalem. It's not Israel. It's Jerusalem. We've already proven that time and again, especially today. So the 70 years have been completed. The generation have been completed. So all the, so this is considered like the firstborn of Israel. Why? Because this is the first time. This 70 years is the first time that Israel, that Jerusalem, they've come back to the land. So that whole 70-year generation, the 70 years we're talking about, they are the new firstborn of Israel. Because Israel hasn't been there all these years since, since the, um, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Yeah. They've been completely abolished and obliterated. They just now came back in these 70 years. So they are the firstborn generation of Israel. This 70 mm -hmm. years is the firstborn. Of so what's happening? I want you to listen carefully. Their 70 years are over with. In these 70 years, they did not bear any fruit. They did not come to Christ. They did not serve, uh, uh, observe the Passovers with Jesus Christ as being their Savior. They did not observe the tabernacles and come to, the, to our Lord and Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach. They've never recognized him. They've never confessed his name. They've never got baptized. They have not borne this fruit. They have not taken the cup. They have not accepted his covenant. They have not accepted his cup. And so what's going to happen now? He's passed. Listen to me carefully. He has passed them over these 70 years. Oh, yeah. He's passed over the firstborn for 70 years. They are the firstborn generation of, of Israel. In this, in this time frame, this modern age that we're in, this is the firstborn of Israel. This is the first generation of 70 years. And now he's passed over them. 70 times he has now passed over them. But he will not pass over them again. Yeah. They have not obeyed their Sabbaths. That's right. And if you go back to uh, the first five, five books of Moses, it talks about what happens. We've, we've gone into detail about what happens when you don't observe the Sabbaths, Sabbaths and God's laws. There's a sevenfold punishment in store for you. Uh, That's what you told me last night. That's exactly yeah. what you said. Go ahead and say that. Yeah, there, there. If, if you go to like that's right, Leviticus, that's uh, Deuteronomy, right. um, it it literally spells out that if you don't observe 
the, the Sabbaths, if you don't observe God's laws, then there's a punishment in store for, for Jerusalem or for any kingdom. And it goes on to list a sevenfold punishment, which is what the tribulations Exactly. Are. That's the point. There's seven See, and that, I wanted you to bring that bigger point out right now. Say that again. That, that's, that's so <clears throat> critical to what we're teaching. Right yeah, there. It, it talks about a sevenfold punishment. It says seven times it's going to be way worse punishment than normal. And that's exactly what you see happening in the tribulations. You, you see a sevenfold seals uh, being unlocked. You have a, a sevenfold trumpets um, being blown as sevenfold right. fold, um, bowls being poured out and all these punishments. And even that is being shortened because if it were to go on longer, then nothing would be left. That's right. Here. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the fine point that uh, Brother Wu brought out last night. And it just, it just all starts gelling together. You see, back in the days of Pharaoh, the days of Moses, the firstborn, they were passed over. The firstborn. And now we're looking that this is, this is Jerusalem. 70 years. The Lord has passed them over. He's passed over the firstborn generation. In modern days, this is the firstborn generation of Israel. This yeah. 70 years. And, and, and literally, the now, the, the just like at the time of the first Passover, just like at the time of Jesus, um, in this future period, the firstborn, the first fruits, which are the bride, the tithe, the 10%, the royal priesthood, they are going to escape all these things and, and not have to deal with these, these punishments. They're going to be passed over That's by right. the blood of the lamb, um, the, the perfect lamb that was slain. Uh, but all of the firstborn of Satan, they're going to begin experiencing huge amounts of punishment. And there's going to be a midnight cry when we leave, uh, you know, on that day of mm -hmm. the tribulation starting uh, the Revelation 5 to Revelation 6 moments uh, when the bride disappears, there's going to be a midnight cry and there's going to be death and destruction and punishment that begins going out across all of the spiritual Egypt, spiritual Sodom which is the world and the capital of that spiritual Sodom is going to be Jerusalem. And there's going to be death and punishment and tribulation that goes out during that time. And the firstborn of Satan, uh, which is, you know, all the evil do doers of this world, they are going to be, you know, a lot of people that are punished starting from the tribulation. That's right. That's right. And, 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 and that midnight cry is, is, is the what there, there, see, this is the part everyone needs to really, really grasp. That midnight cry that Brother Wu's talking about is because of what? Because we, the bride of Christ, have vanished off the face of this earth, and swiftly there's going to become destruction coming upon Jerusalem. Amen. And then what are they going to quickly realize? What are they going to quickly realize after they've been destroyed and we've been taken off the face of the earth? They're going to very quickly realize that there is only one true Savior. There really is only one true God. There really is only one true Yahshua HaMashiach who, who was crucified, died, and was buried and resurrected for us for the remission of our sins. They're going to realize that we, the bride of Christ, we were right this whole time. Amen. And that and man that, of perdition yeah. is going to be revealed at that point. That's right. Um, and, but he's already, in, he's already moving now. The, the, That's the, right. the man of lawlessness, which is the, I, I believe, is the second beast system. Um, it's already moving now. It's, it's been in existence. It's been the great deception. Deception has been in existence for 2000 years through the Catholic church, uh, every, uh, the, the regular institutional church that branched off from it. And they just keep teaching the same falsehoods from 2000 years ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what's going to happen? L l l l hear this. So what's going to happen is this. So the firstborn generation of Israel. This generation right now, they're not going to get passed over anymore. Oh, no. Not He's anymore. done. He's, they've completed their 70 years. Yep. This last Passover, <clears throat> April 4th, 2021, was their final 70th Passover. They completed their 70th. They, this is why Brother Wu and I are saying they're not going to make it to this, this next Passover because it'll be the 71st. And we looked at all the scriptures, and it clearly says that destruction comes after the 70th. Yeah. And there's going to be a small remnant left over uh, for Jerusalem, for Israel. That's right. And I think, I actually think that that 144,000 might be literal. Like there's, it could very well be. Yeah. Cause, cause think of, think about the jab 
like 90% of people being jabbed in certain countries. Yes. Um, and you have 10% left over. Uh, it's that's not a lot of people like like in Israel alone. How, how many people do they have as a population? Like nine, nine million. Nine, it's it's uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, not Sorry. That's like too low. Um, 90 million. Or, I, I actually don't know. No, but, no. Um, they, they, ha- they have a population of about nine, maybe a little bit less than 10 million. Yeah, yeah, nine, ten million. So, and, yeah. and the reports are coming mm-hmm. out that that about ninety percent of Israel is already vaccinated. Yep, and so that's one million left, right? And yeah. then out of that one million, how many are, are Messianic Jews? Um, that, and that how many is- are going to survive the tribulation? <clears throat> exactly. And so that one hundred forty four k that's left over, I think it might even really be literal. There's not yes. going. To, p- people are expecting a huge, like ten percent of whatever to exist, but. Think of the whole population that has existed from the time of the beginning of creation until now. That's right. That's right. You don't need a large population of people to take care of the kingdom of God in the future. If anything, God always got 12 fishermen or, or 12 random people and said that with this, I'm going to change the world. That's um, right. He, he doesn't need uh, billions of people to uh, populate his kingdom. He can rule it with, um, you know, just, just a handful if you wanted. Well, it's the same thing with the, the in the story of Noah, right? I mean, out of the whole earth, and you know, there's there's debates about how many people were on the earth, whether it was a billion or two, wh- whatever it was. But let's suppose there was a billion people on the earth in the days of Noah. Well, out of the whole billion people, he only saved eight. Yeah, that's a really small number of people to save out of eight out of out of a billion people. Exactly, and and uh, we we see that happen over and over again, right? The um, how, how many prophets were there throughout time, major right. and minor? I mean, they were literally, it was like them against the whole kingdom. Sometimes the king wasn't even on their side. That's it, right. Even like the um, other uh, high high um, ranking figures, they all didn't believe them either. And it was literally just them saying, woe unto you, like repent and follow God. It was like one against the whole population. So um, we see that. We see Moses being the only one, and Jacob and Abraham, and you see Noah, and all these people who are are single individuals going against the masses and the whole population of the world, and being the only ones faithful, and that is enough. And God can do so much with just one person. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and one of the points, brother, we and I were going to get to was this: there's in the story of, in the Gospel of Luke, there's this story of the tens uh, of the ten lepers, right? The cleansing of the ten lepers. And so what's happened here? Uh, let's see. He said, so there's 10 lepers, right? And so, and when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass as they went that they were cleansed. So he's, he's cleansed the 10 lepers. He's already healed them. They've been healed, right? And one of them, so one out of the 10, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. So only one out of the 10 turned back and glorified God. And Jesus answering saying, were there not 10 cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found, there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. So what's going on? And he goes, arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. So only one out of the 10 turned back and thanked God and gave glory to God. And Jesus tells him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. So not only was he cleansed, listen to this, not only was he cleansed and healed of his leprosy, but because he turned around and glorified God, not, see, he was first cleansed. And, and, and because he turned around and glorified God, what did Jesus then do? Now he, he made him whole. See, there's a difference. These others were, were cleansed, but they were not made whole. How are you made whole? You're made whole by the blood of Christ. You're made whole by coming into his kingdom. You're made whole by believing in him. And this is what's happened. This 10% who believed and saw that he was healed by the power of God, he glorified God. And now Jesus Christ made him whole. So this is what we're talking about is happening right now. Right now, we, we are, this is the beginnings. This is the beginnings of where tribulation is going to begin. And so we, the bride of Christ, we represent 10% of the church the church as a whole okay but we've come out of the church us 10 percent. we are the 10 percent. we are these 10 percent lepers that are doing what we're glorifying god 
Because when we see that we're healed, we know that it was God that healed us. That's the message of this, of this parable. When he saw that he was healed, he turned back and glorified God. When you see the power of God, when you hear the power of God with your ears, and when you see the power of God with your eyes, if you're the bride and you hear it and you see it, you're going to glorify God. You're going to know that it was God that healed you. And your eyes are open. Your ears are open. You become the bride of Christ. And then Jesus makes you whole. So when we're looking at this parable and we see that it's only 10%, 10% out of the whole 10 uh, lepers, that's the bride of Christ. And this is where we get the 10% from. And so this is what Brother Wu and I are talking about. When you go and look at the world in general right now, in general, I'm not saying every country, but in general, we are watching country after country hitting 75% vaxxed, 80% vaxxed, 90% vaxxed. Israel is deaf. I think they're a little bit over 90% at this point. Okay. So what's happening? I'm gonna, I'm, for those brothers and sisters that are in different countries, let me tell you what's happening here in the United States. Now, it's, it may be different in little states here and there and, and stuff, but in general, in general, the government here is kind of backing off, forcing the vax on people because the United States is just about 70, 80, 90 percent in some areas of being people being vaccinated. Why are they backing off and forcing the vaccinations? Because why? I want this to impact. I want you to hear this. Why? Because these Satanists, these government people who are involved in this one world religion, this one world order, who are involved with giving people the vax because they know it's the mark. They know. They know this story. They know that there's 10% of the bride who will never take the vax. Listen to what I'm telling you. They know that we're here. They know the bride is here. They haven't seen us vanish. They know that the bride is here. And they know that no matter how hard they push this vax, no matter how hard they push to get people to take this poison, that the bride, the 10%, will never take it. So these government leaders, they're already realizing that at this point, they've probably already vaccinated the people who are going to be vaccinated because the bride will never do it. So what? So they're being more lenient. I, the laws in, in the United States and the different cities and the different states, it's, it's not as restrictive as it was before. They're actually laying off. It's, it's, it's not, they're not pushing it. Because they know they've already probably reached their limit and the bride will never take it. So they're going to wait. They're going to wait for us, the bride, to vanish off the face of the earth. And then Satan knows, these Satanists know that once we're gone, then it's going to become mandatory and they're going to force it on everybody. And so this is the finer point that Brother Wu and I wanted to bring out. We talked about this at great length last night. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Brother? Um. No, I think you summed it up really well. <laughs> okay, very well. And and so what else are we seeing? We're, we're also seeing this too. So brother, when I talked about this last night, we go into Luke 21, 9. And we see, uh, this is where Jesus is telling of, of what's going to happen, what's coming. What, what are we going to see on the earth before he comes, right? And what's one of the things he tells us? But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified for these things must first come to pass but the end is not by and by. What are we hearing? And he, and he said, goes on to say, uh, then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. What are we watching in the news, especially the last couple of weeks? I mean, my goodness, Russia is seriously, seriously going after Ukraine with 100,000 troops and tanks and planes and, and all kinds of personnel and other things. And, and, and other countries are seeming to back them up. And China's getting a little rambunctious right now too with their military and, and now all these other countries in Europe, almost all the countries in Europe are, are gearing up in arms to go against Russia. And now the United States, just in the last few days, they're sending uh, troops and they're sending um, equipment and, 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 and the United States is seriously getting involved in this. It is literally nation coming against nation. We are now seeing these verses come to pass and we're hearing of the wars. They haven't started yet, but we're hearing of them. We're hearing of the wars. We're hearing of commotions. We're watching these nations building up right now in these last couple of weeks. This, brothers and sisters, this is now taking the world stage. You are watching these verses take the world stage. Yeah, and there's, there's literally going to be a, um, a moment where Jerusalem is going to be encompassed on all sides. And uh, 
you know, there people are going to flee to the mountains. It, it's it's going to be a catastrophe, uh, judgment on Egypt plus judgment on Jerusalem plus escape type moment at the same time uh, that all plays out. Yeah, Amen, just like, brother. Yeah, just Amen. like the other Passovers throughout history. Yeah, it, 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 when we look at the world stage of what's happening right now, it's very clear that we're, we're watching all of this build up right now. It's, it's literally coming to pass. And as we get closer, brothers and sisters, watch the world stage. As we get closer to Passover, you're going to start seeing all of this building up and building up and building up. It's going to go faster and faster and faster because what we're fully expecting, just like in the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Brother Wu and I talked about this last night. You know, Lot escaped at the same moment that fire and brimstone were falling from the sky. And we fully expect that's what we're going to see now. We, the bride, will be caught up into the throne room at the same moment. Absolute disaster is coming upon the earth. And I fully believe that a big part of that disaster is the desolations of Jerusalem, just like we read earlier in this video. In, in Daniel 9.2 and Daniel 9.24, the, after the completion of 70 years, the desolations of Jerusalem will come. And they've completed their 70 years last year. Understand what we're telling you. We just showed you that Jerusalem just now last year, last Passover, completed their 70 Passovers and 70 tabernacles. They're not going to make it to the next Passover. It very well could be that we, the bride of Christ, get escaped on that very first Passover night. And then total destruction comes onto Jerusalem. Yeah, that seems to be what scripture is pointing to here because even the midnight cry, uh, the original Passover of Moses and the Israelites escaping Egypt, it was on that first Passover night, uh, 14, Nisan 14 going into 15, that midnight cry uh, when the firstborn of Egypt were killed by the angel of death and the firstborn of Israel were redeemed and uh, covered by the blood of the lamb. And they all escaped that day um, together. And it's all a Passover event. So Passover is not just a, it's a, it's not just a eating, eating and drinking wine uh, in remembrance of Jesus. It's, it's so much more than that. It's, it's a marriage. Uh, it's a covenant between the parents of Abraham and God and it's a future fulfilled um, aspect of scripture, which is amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> just, just, okay. One other thing too, and I, this was so important that Brother Wu and I talked about last night. And, and it's so amazing. And, and after Brother Wu and I talked about it last night, it just, it just really meshed and came together. And I know we kind of touched on this a couple of times. I touched on it. You definitely touched on it in your teaching. But I just really wanted to emphasize it a little bit more. Because there's something here that, that, we, that we see on, on this spreadsheet. When we put this out and we show the differences in, in the Passover uh, supper, we clearly see, we clearly see that, you know, the Lord is telling him that the body which is given for you and his testament in his blood is shed for you. But only in Mark and Matthew does it say it's shed for many, right? Shed for many. But there's one slight difference. In Matthew, and we talked about this because it, it 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 there is this slight little difference in Matthew, but for the remission of sins. So his blood was shed for many for the remission of sins, but it doesn't say that in 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 Mark, because we know that there that those that are in the body of Christ, the the bride of Christ, they've been baptized, they've accepted Jesus Christ, and even the left behind church, they've been baptized, they've accepted Jesus Christ, but in in Matthew. They, they, it, Matthew is for the left behind Jews. They've never believed in Jesus. They've never been baptized in his name. And I'm going to prove to you that that's exactly what this means. And so we, we, I pulled it up in scriptures. And so watch this. When you go to Luke, we'll go to Luke 3. So we'll go back into, we'll move down here. Let's go into Luke 3 where it talks about this. Luke 3, 3, I believe it is. Okay, so so this is the uh, John Baptist prepares the way, right? 
and it, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So now we have in Luke for the bride of Christ that there was baptism and preaching for the repentance and remission of sins. The baptism was for the repentance and for the remission of sins. So we clearly see that in Luke. What do we see in Mark? Let's go to Mark 1.4. It's very similar. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It's just about the exact same sentence. So they're, they're being baptized for the repentance and remission of their sins. So that's what we were just showing you, right? That the, that the bride has already accepted Jesus and they've been baptized for the remission of their sins. So it doesn't say that here about the remission of the sins, right? Because they've already accepted Jesus. They've already been baptized in his name. And the same thing for Mark. They're the left behind church, but they still believe they've been left behind, but they still believe in Jesus. They've been baptized in his name, but they've been sleeping. They cared too much for the world. They weren't watching and waiting and looking for their Lord and Savior like the bride's doing. So the, their, his blood was shed for many, but it wasn't for the remission of their sins because they already, they've already been baptized in his name. So I just showed you in Luke and Mark that they've already accepted Jesus. And they were baptized for the repentance, for the remission of their sins. But it doesn't say that in Matthew. Watch this. When we go, when we go to Matthew... They're not being baptized for the remission of their sins. When you go into Matthew, you can't find it. Let's go into Matthew. I believe it's in Matthew 3. John the Baptist prepares the way, right? Watch, watch this. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. There's no remission of sins. Do you catch that? I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Why is he saying that? You see, he's not baptizing them with repentance for the remission of sins. Like it says in Luke and Mark. Drop the mic. He is baptizing them, but only for repentance, but not the remission of their sins. And he's telling them Jesus will come. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because this is after the tribulation. Watch. When they're done with the tribulation, all those, the many who have come to Jesus, all the Jews who've made it through the tribulation, who've come to Jesus, he will come and baptize them for the remission of their sins. And I just proved it to you in the Gospels. Drop the mic. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Brother Wu? I know that was quite a bit, but you know that was something that we really needed to get out there. No, no, I'm glad you brought it up. Because um, we talked about it yesterday and everyone should hear it. <laughs> Yeah, do, do, you, do you see how, how we can go through the Gospels and absolutely prove everything we're telling you? It's only in Luke and Mark are they being baptized for the repentance and remission of their sins. But they've never had remission of their sins. Why? Because Jesus didn't baptize them yet. They won't accept the baptism from Jesus. Just think about it in modern day terms. Can you go to Israel and baptize the Jews in Jesus' name? Is that possible? No. <laughs> no. You, you'd get in so much trouble. <laughs> so let, let's just think about this in very simple, simplistic terms. Can anybody go to Jerusalem or in Israel and grab the Jews and start baptizing them in the name of Jesus for the repentance and remission of their sins? No. They will probably stone you and beat you. What did you say, brother? It's blasphemy. That's right. So they have never been baptized in the name of Jesus for the repentance and remission of their sins, because they don't believe in Jesus. First, they don't even believe in him, and they've never been baptized in his name for the repentance and remission of sins. This is what we're seeing in Matthew 3.3 3 that I just showed you. 
God is saying, I'll baptize you for the repentance of your sins. If you want to repent of what you're doing, I'll baptize you. But it's not me that's going to forgive you. It's not me that's going to baptize you for the forgiveness and remission of your sins. He says, there is one mightier than I that shall come after me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch. He shall baptize you. You see? And mm -hmm. when? When the tribulation is over with, all those Jews who finally come to Jesus, all those who finally tabernacle with our Lord, all those who finally give their lives to our Lord and Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach, then he will baptize them for the remissions of their sins for having for after having believed in him and were baptized in his name. This, this is going to happen after Amen. the tribulation. I, yeah, I agree. Uh, they're going to, they're going to come to, to Christ and uh, Jews are actually familiar with the idea of mikvah, which is baptism. That's well, right. So That's it, right. It, it's ritualistic cl cleansing. So if they were to have the full understanding of mikvah and actually a lot of Christians, they don't even understand that, uh, the bap baptism came from mikvah, uh, from from Jewish tradition. And even when you convert to Judaism, you do a mikvah, and then you convert and you change your name and and everything. Um, but that you're literally having that same exact thing happen here too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it, it's it's really interesting how um, the Jews are actually following more of. Like, like, for example, like when you said that they they play, they play, have a place setting for the Messiah, they put a cup for the Messiah at certain yeah. ceremonies. <laughs> They're waiting for him, you know? Yeah, they, 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 don't, they don't know how right they are. Exactly, yeah. They, it, they're so close to it. And they're, they're yeah. like doing all of the, 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 these rituals that have been around for thousands of years, for 6,000 years, <laughs> uh, that, that point them towards Messiah. Like their and their whole existence, their feasts, everything points towards Messiah, yeah, of Jesus Christ, and they don't see it as Yeshua. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing, yeah. They're, they're doing a lot of the the rituals and the feasts, and it's all pointing to Jesus, but they don't see it. Yeah, they don't see he's already been here, and and they're already celebrating uh, events and, and and things of of him that he's already been here, and yet they're waiting for him. And, and but you know what's beautiful is that God does not forgive for forget that remnant. He does not forget the promise that He made to Abraham and to the Jews, the forefathers, the patriarchs. And there is going to be that remnant, that beautiful, strong, gung ho for the Lord remnant, that 144k of the Jews. That you know that is enough. 12k from from each tribe. Amen. Amen. Okay, brother, I, I think I've wrapped up most of the, the things I wanted to, to just review uh, with you um, uh, over this open mic. And um, But certainly, if, there, if there's something I may have missed that we talked about last night, certainly bring it up. I'm, I'm ready to go if you'd like to talk about some more things. No, um, I know that we have some things already planned for the next video. Yes. So yeah, sure. I don't want to uh, jump into that too quickly. I think okay. it's good to focus on Passover. <laughs> yeah yeah sounds good brother yeah i appreciate it because you know th th this has been a long teaching but it's been a long time in coming and, and and you know as well as i do we don't make videos just to make videos we, we took this to the lord the last two months in great earnest and in great prayer and supplications to our lord and and i hope this is a testament to all the brothers and sisters that are watching this video is that brother Wu and i don't do this for views we don't do it for money we don't do it for for glamour or notoriety. We don't make videos just to make a video. We, we make a video because we know in our heart of hearts that this ministry from day one has always been Holy Spirit led. And we're only going to teach the, the truth straight out of scriptures. Yeah, I, I think uh, our focus has always been about God and wanting to seek the day um, of when he might come because the Magi, um, Daniel, um, you know, other people, at, even at the time of Jesus, like, they knew when the Messiah was going to come. They knew to follow the signs in scripture. They knew that there were patterns there. Um, and so, you know, just humbly, all we're doing is really seeking that out, seeking the Lord. More than anything, if you guys can draw closer to the Lord through some of these truths uh, and the things that we talk about, then that's the most important thing. Um, it's the, the, the moment now that we draw closer to the Lord in relationship is an extension of tomorrow and the next moment and when we actually see jesus christ face to face um not just a shadow um so 
you know, I encourage you guys, as Charles said, we don't do this for money. It's almost the, you know, 1230 in the morning. And I have a, like a two-year-old kid and a wife who doesn't like that I do these things all the time. Um, and, you know, we put in a lot of study, uh, not for the sake of glory, uh, but just to seek the Lord, um, because, you know, we're not perfect people. Like me and Charles, um, we, we do this because we love God, not because we, we and, and, and we enjoy doing it. We have fun seeking the Lord and scripture and talking to each other about these things and praying for each other and praying for you guys and um, going through daily life struggles um, and sacrificing to make these things happen, to be able to fellowship with you guys and with the Lord and the Holy Spirit. So thank you so much, guys, for you know encouraging us and for praying for us. And thank you, Charles, for praying for me and for uh, being there for me as a brother in my hard times. Uh, and I pray that you guys would, you know, uh, seek the Lord with us in this time of fellowship. And I I'm so grateful for it. Yep. Amen, brother. Amen. And thank you, brother, for your, for your brotherhood and your love and your prayers and your encouragement and, and the fellowshipping we had. You know, last night we were only going to talk for just a little bit, maybe 15, 20 minutes. It turned into a three and a half hour, 2.30, almost three o'clock in the morning. Holy Spirit led, Holy Spirit filled conversation. I was just, it was just through the roof, you know, and we found more things. And, and believe me, brothers and sisters, we have a lot more, you know, it, it all involves what we taught today. So today you have, you have the, the framework of what we're teaching and what we're honing in on, but we have a lot more, but we're going to put it into the next video. Um, there, there's a lot of meat here. There, there's, there's quite a bit. I mean, this is probably got to be the greatest find. In, in biblical history, where we can literally point to our own Savior's words, where he's telling us the Passover wasn't fulfilled, but it will, it will be fulfilled. Passover will be fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven when his new covenant is fulfilled, that he shed for you his bride. Amen. 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 This is just absolutely mind-blowing. I love this teaching. I love the fact that, Brother Wu, you were able to, to help me bring this word out to... Um, to all of the bride of Christ, I, I appreciate your steadfastness, your loyalty, your, your your faith in our Lord, your love for our Lord, and and all you do for our brothers and sisters in this ministry. Thank you, brother. Who I really appreciate you. I love you, brother. You're a good brother. Uh, thank uh, thank you, you for your you prayers too. and your encouragement. This has just been absolutely a wonderful teaching. I can't wait to make the next video. And so, brothers and sisters, just just so all you know, we're gonna let this video run for about ten days, maybe two weeks at the most until we make our next video, because we really want this to get out there. We really want this video to get out there. And that's why this whole video was based on, on only this teaching. We want this video to stand on its own. So even a week from now, two weeks from now, a month from now, you can watch this video and you can point, we can point to exactly what we're looking to come. The fulfillment of the Passover, which will take place in the kingdom of heaven. And there's no doubt in my mind, this verse, these verses alone, prove in our own saviors yashua hamashiach's own word of when he's coming to fulfill his covenant with his bride and now we realize we've seen there's only one day only one time in this entire year that's coming where this is absolutely possible only this one day in this one time frame so with that brother if there's anything else you'd have you'd like to add we can conclude this video no this was a an honor and a pleasure Amen. Praise Amen, God. Amen, brother. Amen. All glory to God. All glory to God, indeed. Absolutely. Okay, so with that, um, let me see. Uh, I'm going to bring a few couple things up real quick, and then we'll bring this video to a close. And let me see. We've got right here. Okay. So, okay, so let's bring this video to a, cl a close, dear brother. Um, uh, once again, I want to very sincerely give our, our thanks to all of our YouTube moderators, Gino, Benito, JC, Cherish, Darren, and Jimmy, for all of their love, support, and encouragement, and for assisting as moderators for our live videos. Thank you all so very much for your time and devotion as you have given this to this family and to this ministry. We truly, truly thank you with all of our hearts. Um, and thank you, Brother Wu. I'd like, just like to give us another special thanks to Brother Wu because uh, what, what a lot of you guys don't know is Brother Wu is diligently in the background of the Sword of God ministry, and he does all the operations for our YouTube videos, and he makes sure everything streams seamlessly. He he knows all about the computer stuff, 
and he's doing a fantastic job in the background of all this. And, and, and again, thank you, Brother Wu. I really appreciate you and love you for, for making this happen. Thank you so much. Okay, my, my dear brothers and sisters, I want to personally thank each and every one of you for standing by our ministry. Thank you so much for sharing your lives with us, for sharing your innermost feelings, your fears, your emotions, your love, uh, your heartaches, your joys, your time of happiness, your sorrows. Thank you all so much for your love and your support, your encouragement, your prayers. Thank you for all that you do and bring to the table uh, for our Lord and Savior and for his kingdom. Thank you so much. Um, brothers and sisters, thank you all for your steadfast loyalty. Thank you all for keeping the faith, for keeping in prayer, and for keeping watch with us as we go through these last of days before our Lord and Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach, returns for us, his bride, to escape us off the face of the earth. I want to encourage each and every one of you to continue your faithfulness, stay in prayer, and continue to watch with us. Brothers and sisters, this is the time. This is the moment in time we've all witnessed last year that Jerusalem did in fact complete their 70 years as we just showed you in Daniel 9.2 and Daniel 9.24. And as you've seen in, in our last several videos, we've proven all of that. Brothers and sisters, this ministry has been and continues to be giving great warning to all the earth and to the time frame that is clearly upon us now. As for me and this family and this entire ministry, we will pray and we will keep watch. I am asking all watchmen, all ministries, and all the bride of Christ to rise up, lift up your heads, be counted, warn others as we see that date approaching. I'm inviting all ministries, all watchmen, and all the entire bride of Christ to now join us together as one voice, one accord, as one body of Christ, as one bride, as we prepare for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach. There is no reward for those who, who do not warn his sheep. Their blood and their sins are upon your head, as we are told in Ezekiel 33. If you do not warn his people, brothers and sisters, we have been chosen as watchmen. We must now complete our jobs as true watchmen. Let us all come together as one voice and one accord, as one bride of Christ, and blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, as we see that day approaching. Brothers and sisters, we are being watchful for that date as we see it approaching us. And as watchmen, we are informing the bride of Christ as to our findings. Brothers and sisters, please do not be caught unawares. Be awake. Keep watch. We must continue to march forward and proclaim his holy name and his holy word unto all the earth. Brothers and sisters, as we see in this, in this picture here of this, of this athlete racing, he's running the race. Keep the faith, brothers and sisters. Keep in the race for your souls. For the race for eternal life with our Lord and Savior. Stay the course. Stay on track. Stay in prayer. And as it says here in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Brothers and sisters, we are almost home. We are in the final days of this race. The finish line is straight ahead. Keep marching on with great faith. He has promised to escape us, his bride, off the face of the earth. The bride is not appointed to wrath. We, the bride of Christ, await our tabernacle's event on Passover. When he promised to fulfill Passover in the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, the victory is ours. Soon we'll be at the finish line, brothers and sisters, and we'll be at rest with our Lord and Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach, in the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, let's lift each other up in these times of trials and tribulations. As we see that day approaching, go in peace, love one another, edify one another, and spread his holy gospel into all the earth. Be of good courage and of great hope to one another. Go out into all the world and proclaim his holy word, his holy gospel, and the good news. Spread his word, anoint your family and friends, gather his flock, Bring them in during these last of days. This is our duty as watchmen and the bride. Gather his sheep in his name. Anoint them as I have anointed you, as we all have done in our anointing ceremonies and the sword of God ministry. Brothers and sisters, this will multiply his flock. This is our duty as he would have us do in the last of days. And now, brothers and sisters, as we always do, we're going to go over some of these scriptures and read them. As it says in Luke 10, 23 to 24, and he turned unto him his disciples and said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear the things which you hear and have not heard them. And brothers and sisters, as it says in John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit 
and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. And brothers and sisters, as we're told in Hebrews 10, 25, for not forsaking the assembly of others, of our, uh, for not, I'm sorry, for not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see that day approaching. And brothers and sisters, we clearly see that day approaching. And as we're told in Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And brothers and sisters, that's exactly what Brother Wu and I are doing in this ministry. We are diligently seeking him. As we see that day approach, we are clearly diligently seeking him. And the hallmark ministry, uh, the hallmark verse of this ministry, Luke 21, 36, watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. And in Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And as we are told in Luke 9, 27, but I tell you of a truth, there'll be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And brothers and sisters, my favorite verses, Revelations 22, 17 and Revelation 22, 20. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And brothers and sisters, as I always do, I leave you with this. Keep the faith, keep in prayer, and keep watch. God bless each and every one of you and your beloved families. Amen and amen. God bless you and your families always. Amazing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves